a few years ago, a teacher who had been working with primary students with uh, part part whole grids asked me if I could do the same kind of a grid for multiplication. So I started experimenting and came up with this idea of a factor factor total grid. And it's set up essentially the same way as it has been with, with addition and subtraction, part part whole grids. But now we add one more feature, which is this idea of a multiplication sign down kind of between the two parts, or what used to be the parts, but are now going to be the factors. So at this point, we now have a factor, factor, and we could say product up here, grid, but in reality, I like to call it a total grid because then when we t take a look at the inverse operation of division, we'll be able to think of it as the total and not get kind of hung up with the language of product. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like in just a minute. But for now, I, I also want you to notice that I've got labels, and I don't usually label a part-part-whole grid, but for multiplication and division, there's a really important point that the two factors with manipulatives or with real-life situations actually have two different meanings. So typically, with many, many multiplication and division problems, we think about how many groups or how many parts we have uh, that are equally sized. And then we also think about if we know the size of one of those parts or groups, then we know all of the information we need to multiply those two quantities. So for instance, if I said there were, I don't know, four packs of gum and there were five sticks of gum in each pack so five sticks in each or per pack now I have all the information I need to multiply when we multiply we don't really just multiply four times five or four packs times five sticks, and somehow we magically get 20 sticks. And what we're really doing is we're multiplying a number of groups by this ratio that is the number of sticks per pack of gum. And if you ever wanted to be really technical about this, what happens is the packs divided by the packs cancels out, and that's how we wind up with four packs times five sticks, really five sticks per pack, turning into 20 sticks of gum. So this is called, this ratio is called an intensive ratio. It is internal to the meaning, and it turns out that when we multiply, we all, almost always, now there are a, different kinds of multiplication situations, but in most of the ones we do with elementary students, we're using an intensive quantity, a ratio. When we multiply using this factor, factor, total grid, we're going to go ahead and input the information that we've gotten about the number of groups and also about the number in each group. So the left hand factor in this factor factor total I usually label as the number of groups. So in this case the story might go something like this. There were seven rows of penguins marching into the ocean, and each row had 10 penguins in it. Now this is a goal one multiplication problem, and 
as you can see, what we're really saying is seven rows times 10 penguins in each row. And the question that we're going to be asking is, how many penguins marched into the ocean? And so in this case, we're going to then be able to show, okay, there's seven rows of penguins, and there are seven rows of penguins, and there are 10 penguins in each row. So this is a typical multiplication problem. We can show it on a factor-factor total grid with the manipulatives, although we don't quite get to show the seven here. Well, we sort of did because I indicated that there were seven rows with seven lines. And uh, you can you certainly start off by putting the manipulatives straight onto a large factor-factor total grid. When we, when we switch to division, it's going to look just a little bit different. With division, I really almost always start by asking the students to show the dividend, the, num the total number that we're going to start with in a division problem. So in this story, in the reverse of the multiplication story we just looked at, I'm going to ask the students to set up 70 penguins. Now, if they're using animal strips, they look like penguins. If they're using unifix cubes or the happy hundreds chart or the Slavonic abacus, it's not going to really look like penguins, but they're going to have something that 70 somethings that represent the 70 penguins. And then I'm either going to give them the information about the number of groups or I'm going to give them the information about the number in each group, and then I'll ask them about the other one. So in this particular case, we're going to start off with telling the students that there were 70 penguins marching into the ocean, and they marched in seven equal rows. And then the question in that particular problem will be how many were in each of those rows or groups. And so they can go ahead and put, organize their 70 penguins into seven rows if they hadn't already done that. And they'll be able to then count or notice that there are 10 in each group. So they'll be able to go ahead and record that where the question mark is. So 10 in each group. The other kind of division, the other type, is where we start by telling the students once again there, that there were a total number of penguins, in this case 70, and now we're going to be able to tell them the, the number in each group. So we'll say and those penguins were marching into the ocean with 10 in each group or each row. And then we're going to be asking them, so how many different groups or how many equal groups were marching into the ocean? And in this case, they'll be able to make sure that they've put their penguins in groups of 10. They might or might not have, depending on how they thought of the 70 to begin with. Goal one is actually pretty easy for division because we're, we're used to keeping the manipulatives in groups of 10. When we get to the later goals, the students will probably have more adjusting to do. So once they've got their 70 penguins organized so that they're, they have 10 penguins in each group, now they'll be able to notice that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven equal rows. And so they'll be able to go ahead and answer the question, seven rows.
So just to review, when we go ahead and set up a division problem where we know the total and where we know the number of parts or groups and we're looking to find out how many are in each group, we call this partitive division. And when we know the total, and the measure of each group, and what we're looking for is how many equal groups there are, then we call that measurement division. Or, in more technical writings, they also call it quotative division. When you want to go ahead and do a factor factor total grid with just numbers rather than manipulatives, you can do the exact same scenarios, or you can change the story somewhat if you'd like. For goal one division, we could do something like we were able to bake 50 cookies for a bake sale, and we want to package them in five equal sized baggies. And so in that case, we know the total, and we know the number of groups, or the number of parts, and so then the question would be, how many cookies can there be in each baggie? And the students, hopefully, when you've been able to shift to the abstract, are ready to think about 50 divided by 5 is 10. Just to review, this is partitive division because we know the number of equal parts. We can also take that story and tell it the, the reverse situation where we know 50 cookies were baked and we know that we want to put 10 cookies in each baggie. And so our question is, how many baggies are we going to need? And so in this particular case, we've got 50 divided by 10, 50 cookies divided by 10 cookies per baggie means that we need five baggies. And so this particular kind of division is measurement division because we know the measure of one baggie's worth of cookies. So we actually know the measure of every baggie's worth of cookies. One of the questions you might be wondering about is whether it's important for you to teach students these two different types to distinguish them, to be able to know when they're working with partitive division and when they're working with measurement division. And I can't say that I've ever seen any research that supports either doing that or not doing that, but you may find that it really helps students to make sense of word problems and whether they should be multiplying or dividing. And you may not think that that's a super big issue when it's a very simple whole number kind of multiplication or division problem. But we know that when the students get to division or uh, multiplication and division of fractions or decimals, then those word problems can become much more confusing for them because their intuitions about whether the answer is going to get larger or smaller than the information provided can lead them down the wrong path and they'll they'll be thinking, well, it must work like whole number multiplication and division, and it doesn't always. So 
it really is helpful for students as they move into fourth, fifth, and sixth grades to be able to understand these ideas of number of groups and number in each group and total and which of the three pieces of information are they working with whether they have those fancy names of partitive division and measurement division. I don't know that that's critical. If you want to give them different names, that's, that's probably going to work just as well, if not better. So I hope that this turns out to be helpful for you and your students and that you'll be able to spend really serious quality time on division. Because as I've worked with older students in middle school and high school, if they're going to have trouble with multiplication or division, it's very frequently division.